In this video, we'll see two period repeated games. Specifically, we'll look at the repeated game where two players play this particular normal form game in period one, and then they play the same normal form game in period two. Before we address what a strategy should be for a player, I find it instructive to write down the extensive form, or at least think about the extensive form. It's actually not entirely practical to write down a full extensive form of this game, but we can think about what that extensive form looks like in order to form an idea of what each player's strategy is. Notice that player 1 has two actions they can take in the stage game, A and B, and player 2 has three actions, X, Y, and Z. And in the stage game, they choose these actions simultaneously. So if we were to draw an extensive form of this game, it would look like this. The first period portion of the game tree is this part. Player 1 chooses between A and B, and player 2 does not observe that choice, and so these two decision nodes are in the same information set for player 2, and player 2 chooses between X, Y, and Z, and player 2 makes the same choice at both the decision nodes in this information set. This node corresponds to player 1's choice of what to do in period 2 after, in the first period, they've played A and X respectively. So in this subgame, they're playing the same simultaneous move game where player 1 chooses A and between A and B, and player 2 chooses between X, Y, and Z, but they're doing this after having played A and X respectively in the first round. The part of the game tree that would follow this node would look exactly the same as this, except the payoffs would be different because the payoffs from the first round would be different. Where I've written down the, ter the payoffs at the terminal nodes, for example, at this node, they've played A and X respectively in the first round, A and X respectively in the second round, so their first period payoff is 4 and 3 respectively, and the second period payoff is 4 and 3 respectively as well. So the total payoff is then 8 and 6 respectively. In this column, I've written down the first period payoff, and in the next column, I've written down the second period payoff. And the total payoff is the sum of the two. At each of these terminal nodes, the first period payoff is going to be exactly the same because they paid, played A and X respectively to get to this subgame. So for every terminal node in that subgame, the first period payoff is going to be exactly the same. It's going to be 4, 3. The second period payoffs are going to depend on what they do in the second period. So if they play A, Z, for example, the payoffs in the second period are going to be 1, 4. That gets added to their first period payoffs of 4 and 3. So the difference between this subgame and any of the subgames that I've not drawn, because there would be too many of them to draw and this diagram would get too complicated, the only difference would be the first period payoffs. For example, the game tree following this, the second period payoffs corresponding to the choice in the second period would be exactly the same as I've written in this column, except that the first period payoffs instead of 4, 3 would be 0, 0. Now how many different information sets are there for each of the players? Because that's what tells us what a strategy needs to be. Remember, a strategy is a complete contingent plan and has to tell us what the player does at every information set where that player could be called to play at how many information sets does a strategy need to tell us what that player will do. For player 1, notice here the player 1 plays at, at all of these. So aside from the initial node, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 different information sets where player 1 could be called to play. In fact, there's one after each of the possible outcomes from the stage game in period 1. So each of these corresponds to one outcome of the first period stage game. So for player one, there's the initial node and one information set for each outcome of the first period stage game. And for player two, there's this one here. There's one like this for every outcome of the first period stage game. So again, for player two, there's one for every information set of player one. So what we then see is that we can write down a strategy as telling us what the player should do at the initial node and what the player should do following each possible outcome of the first period stage game. In other words, a strategy would be able to fill in the blanks here. It tells us what you do in period one, and following each possible outcome, what's the corresponding action that you should take in period two. If we want to figure out what the subgame perfect equilibria are, we're going to do that by backwards induction. We're going to start with the smallest subgames, which are the period two stage games, figure out what the players need to do there, and work our way backwards. Let me scroll back to this picture of this extensive form. What we see here is that the payoffs in this subgame are the payoffs from the stage game plus a constant for each player. For each possible outcome, we're adding four for player one and three for player two. 
So the player's preferences over which outcome happens is the same as if we were to play the stage game as a one-shot game. So for example, if in the first period we were to play A1 and A2 respectively, so player 1 plays action 1, player 2 plays action 2, then the payoffs in the subgame following that profile of actions in the first period would be the following. If they play A and X respectively, remember this is in the second round, and they're following the actions A1 and A2 in the first round, so the history is A superscript 1, which is the action profile from the first period, so they're following the action profile A11 and A12. They're going to get the first period period payoff of U1 of A1 and U2 of A1, where again, remember, A1 is the action profile from the first period. Plus, they're going to get the second period payoff of 4 and 3 respectively. Similarly, if they pay, played, let's say, B and Z, they would get 0 each in the second period, but they'd still get their first period payoff of U1 of A1 and U2 of A1. So what you see here is that player 1's preference over the various outcomes is going to be exactly the same as it was in the stage game because we're just adding the same number to all the different outcomes. So the utility difference between any two outcomes is exactly the same as it were if we didn't add that. Why am I telling you this? It's because of the important fact that when you retain the same preference over the outcomes, then the set of Nash equilibria of the game remains the same as the stage game. So since player 1 and 2 have the same preferences over the outcomes as they do in the one-shot stage game, regardless of what happened in the first period, the set of Nash equilibria of the subgame are exactly the Nash equilibria of the one-shot stage game. So we know that in the second period, they have to play a Nash equilibrium of the one-shot stage game. So if we just look at the stage game as not a repeated game, and we find the Nash equilibria of that, what they do in the second period has to be one of those equilibria of the stage game played as not a repeated game. This lesson is actually generally true of any stage game. And it's true for any number of periods, capital T, as long as we're talking about the last period. In our quest to find the subgame perfect equilibria of this two-period game, we need to first solve, then, for the Nash equilibria of the stage game. So let's scroll back to the stage game. It's easy enough to verify that there are two Nash equilibria of this stage game. So if player 1 plays A, player 2's best response is to play Z, because 4 is higher than 0 and 3. And if player 2 plays Z, then player 1's best response is to play A rather than B because A gives a payoff of 1, B gives a payoff of 0. So AZ is a Nash equilibrium, as well as BY. BY is also a Nash equilibrium. If player 1 plays B, no matter what else player 2 plays, she gets 0. If she plays Y, she gets 1, so Y is the best response to B. Similarly, if player 2 plays Y, playing A leads to a payoff of 0, so player 1 chooses B and gets a payoff of 2. So BY and AZ are the two Nash equilibria of this stage game. So by our reasoning here, we know that the second period has to involve either AZ or BY. Now we can move back to the first period. What could they do in the first period? Could they just play one of these Nash equilibria in the first period? Sure, that would be a subgame perfect equilibrium. This would be a situation where both players are essentially ignoring the fact that this is a repeated game. So they play a one-shot game in period one, and they play again a one-shot game in period two. And since they're both Nash equilibria, playing them repeatedly is going to not only be a Nash equilibrium, but it's also going to be subgame perfect because in the subgame it's a Nash equilibrium. So we could conceive of, for example, a strategy for each player along the following lines. So for example, we could have a strategy for player 1 that says play A in period 1 and play B in period 2 no matter what happened in period 1. Similarly for player 2 we could have a strategy that says play Z in period 1 and Y in period 2 no matter what happened in period 1. S1 and S2 defined in this way form a subgame perfect equilibrium. In period 1 they end up playing AZ and in period 2 they end up playing BY. In fact, we could find an equilibrium where they play BY in the first period and AZ in the second period, AZ in both periods, BY in both periods. They're, these are all subgame perfect equilibria. In fact, there's a general lesson here. For any stage game, not necessarily this one, any sequence of stage game Nash equilibria forms a subgame perfect equilibrium. That result shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to you. You probably expected that. But the more interesting question is is that all you can do? 
are there subgame perfect equilibria that aren't just sequence of stage game Nash equilibria? You would hope so. Otherwise, what would be the point of looking at repeated games? After all, this would amount to just looking at a series of one-shot games. So indeed, the second period, or in general the last period, always has to be a Nash equilibrium of the stage game. But if there are more than one Nash equilibria, like in this example, we can make the strategies history dependent, in the sense that which Nash equilibrium you play in the second period depends on what happened in the earlier period. Let me give you an example. The strategy for player one is to play A in period one, and following this, the outcome AX in period one, play A again in period two, and following any other outcome in period one, play B in period two. For player two, the strategy is play X in period one, and following the outcome AX in period one, play Z in period two. Following any other outcome in period one, play Y in period two. These strategies S1 and S2 constitute a subgame perfect equilibrium. Notice that in the first round, they play AX. However, AX is not a Nash equilibrium of the stage game. In the second round, having played AX in the first round, they play AZ. AZ is a Nash equilibrium of the stage game, and as we've seen earlier, in the second period, they have to play a Nash equilibrium of the stage game. But as we see here, this gives us an example that they don't have to play a Nash equilibrium of the stage game in the first period. To verify that these strategies constitute a subgame perfect equilibrium, let's first observe that indeed in every subgame they constitute a Nash equilibrium because in period two they're either playing AZ or BY, and both of those are Nash equilibria of the stage game. So in every subgame they're playing a Nash equilibrium. So what we need to figure out then is that if we move backwards, that the choices made in the first round also constitute a Nash equilibrium of the whole game. The way we're going to do that is to observe that we know which Nash equilibrium of the stage game they're going to play in each subgame. So in each period two stage game, we know which Nash equilibrium they're going to play. So we can prune the tree and replace the subgames with the payoff they would get at the Nash equilibrium of that subgame. So we'll go back to our game tree here that we've drawn. In this subgame here, we know that following AX, they're going to play the Nash equilibrium AZ. So player one is going to play A, player two is going to play Z. So the payoff from this subgame is going to be 4, 3 plus 1, 4. So we can replace this node with those payoffs. And we can do that for each of these nodes. And then we can resolve to find that AX would be a Nash equilibrium of the resulting game. So we'll go back and draw this pruned tree where we've replaced the subgames with the payoffs from the subgames. The way these strategies are set up, if player 1 and player 2 both play A and X respectively, then the Nash equilibrium that they're going to play in period 2 is AZ, which yields a payoff of 1 and 4 respectively. So their first period payoff is going to be 4, 3 because they played A and X. And their second period payoff is given by AZ is 1, 4. So their total payoff is 5, 7. For any other outcome, so for example AY or AZ, the first period payoff is added to the second period payoff. But the second period payoff is not going to be 1, 4. But rather, because of the way the strategies are set up, they're going to play this Nash equilibrium BY in the second period. So in each of these cases, they're going to get 2, 1. So we add to this first period payoff to 1. When we add these all together, we get these total payoffs. Now we can figure out what the Nash equilibrium of this game is. If player 1 plays A, what's player 2's best response? Well, player 2 can pick between X, Y, and Z. And if player 2 believes that player 1 is playing A, the best response is to then pick X, because Y would give a payoff of 1, and Z would give a payoff of 5. On the other hand, if player 1 believes player 2 is going to play X, either player 1 could play A and get a payoff of 5, or she could play B and get a payoff of 2. So again, A is a best response, and so since they're mutual best responses, playing AX in the first round would be a Nash equilibrium of this pruned tree. And therefore, the strategies that we wrote down, S1 and S2, constitute a subgame perfect equilibrium of this game. Between these two equilibria, BY and AZ, we can look at AZ as rewarding player 2. So player 2 likes AZ better than player 2 likes BY. They get a payoff of 4 from AZ, but only a payoff of 1 from BY. So we can tell a story about this equilibrium. 
And what's happening in this equilibrium is that player one and player two are shooting to get 4-3 in the first round. This gives player one the highest payoff player one could possibly get. However, if player 2 does not follow through on this sort of implicit agreement to provide player 1 with a payoff of 4, then we can think of BY as kind of being a punishment for player 2, or of AZ and payoff of 4 of being a reward for player 2 for helping or not helping player 1 in the first round. These sort of punishment or reward dynamics are even more pronounced when we have infinitely repeated games, as we'll see. The moral of the story here is that you can always support a sequence of stage game Nash equilibria as a subgame perfect equilibrium, but sometimes you can have other subgame perfect equilibria that aren't just a sequence of stage game Nash equilibria, and they are often quite interesting and intuitive.